From the pen of the Apostle Paul, a challenge to let our light shine in the darkest of times, realizing that in the midst of our weakness, His grace is sufficient. A letter to the saints in Corinth, defined by three words, trust, treasure, triumph. Welcome to our verse-by-verse -verse study of 2 Corinthians as we learn to stand for truth while empowered by the grace of God. As we continue our series, Trust, Treasure, Triumph, we are looking at the wonderful book of 2 Corinthians and we're looking at it verse by verse. The reason we like verse by verse at Quentin Road is because you can't miss anything, you can't skip anything. Uh, you're getting the full counsel of God and there are parts of the scripture that we come to when we say, well, how is that going to apply to people's lives today? But you know what, every time I open it up and every time I study it, I find there is great application to what I'm dealing with this week. Isn't it incredible how God does that? And you're gonna find something today that he intends for you if you are spiritual. In other words, if you are here with the right attitude to say, Lord, teach me something today. I, I wanna learn, even if it's something that's gonna make me mad or I'm not gonna agree with it right away. If it's in the word of God, Lord, convict me of that and help me to change and be more and more like the Son of God. I've been talking about certain things are a good thing, like when robbery is a good thing, and we obviously know robbery isn't a good thing, but in the context of what the Apostle Paul was teaching the Corinthian Christians, we found that it was okay that he was uh, committing robbery because he was stealing from the other church's support, not stealing, but taking from their support even though the Corinthians weren't supporting him and still doing things and blessing them and helping them. So we're coming today to, again, a similar type of a title, and that's when foolishness or being foolish is a good thing. I'll start off by telling you a, a couple stories of men that are foolish. The first one is a housework challenged husband. Any of you fit that category? And uh, he was going to be the hero and wash his own sweatshirt. So he goes into the laundry room. Like within seconds, he yells out to his wife, honey, what settings do I put the washer? There's a zillion settings. What setting do I, do I use? So she yells back in, what does your shirt say? He said, oh, uh, University of Oklahoma. I mean, that guy needs some help, right? That guy needs some help, because he went to the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, you know, and then, and then a different guy, but very much fits the same category. A wife was sitting there at breakfast one day, and he's reading the paper. The paper is something they used to put out with the news, and you'd hold it and open it and stuff. Anyways, so I'm just trying to make sure the millennials know what I'm talking about. It's like when you talk about phone booths and, you know, things like that. So anyways, he's reading the paper, and she just makes this comment. I just can't believe it. I just keep forgetting things. I think I've almost completely lost my mind. He looks up over the paper and said, honey, I know why. You've been giving a piece of it to me for 20 years. Okay, now that's not the foolishness I'm talking about. That is not a good thing. The, uh, husbands, here's one piece of advice for you. Never say what first comes to your mind, okay? Just keep it, keep it contained. But when being foolish is a good thing, we're gonna talk about this today in four categories. The first is don't be fooled. In 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13, we're reading in 13, 14, and 15 about a deceiver. And this deceiver's really, really, really good. But we've been warned. We know he's out there. We know what he's up to. We know what he's capable of. And by knowing that and being warned of it, we're, we should be kind of a lot more careful. And our radar is up and we're watching and we're looking for it. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 says, for such are false apostles. The Corinthians had been duped. 
They were saying bad things about the real apostle. If there was ever such a thing as a super apostle, it was Paul. And they were saying he was in it for the money, he's ignorant, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He, if he was of God, he wouldn't have gone through all those persecutions. These were false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You say, wait a second, you, you mean everyone that claims the name of God and of Christ isn't of Christ? <laughs> Don't be shocked about that. If you ever turn on Christian TV, I'm gonna say 80% of what you see is not of God. Maybe more, okay? If, if going to a Christian bookstore, I'm gonna say the same thing. 80% of what's on the Christian bookshelves aren't of God. And that might really shock you, and that might say, no, if, if they say uh, I'm of God, or if they say the name Christ, they must be good, they must be okay. No, what, what we're being warned of is here is, they may be, but let's be very cautious about it. Let's examine them. Why? Because they can transform themselves. How could people do that? Why would people do that? Well, here's why, the verse 14, and no marvel, okay, don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So the one that is the, the, the originator of lies, of evil, of deceit, he you know, you, you think of the devil, right? You, you think of horns, you think of a red suit, you think of a tail with a point on it, and you think of a pitchfork. How many of us are gonna be fooled by that? We're all gonna probably jump and run away from that, right? So that's not what he does. He makes himself look like an angel of light. In other words, he does this himself. This is how he gets his foot in the door. You say, wow, that looks good, that looks Christian, that looks fine, that looks wholesome, that looks no problem. Because he's deceiving, he's making himself, he's, he's making himself look godly, but he's not, of course. Therefore, verse 15, it is no great thing if his ministers, these are those false apostles, those deceitful workers, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end, by the way, this is the end result of those people and of Satan himself, whose end shall be according to their works. There will be hell to pay for these. But deceit is their game. And how is it that the devil can be such a great deceiver? I think what we have to do is understand the, the origination of the devil. Some people think, here's God, here's the devil, it's this big battle between good and evil. This is not how it is, because if, if this is how it is, God and the devil, they're on equal planes. But God is here, always existed, wasn't created. Here is the devil, was created. You say, well, why would God have created the devil? Well, let's find out about the origination of the devil um, in Ezekiel 28. Look at verse 12. Now, Ezekiel 28, 27 and 28 is, is a curse upon Tyre and upon the, the prince of Tyre, okay? It was this wicked city that God judged, and, but then we read about the king of Tyre in verse 12, and it's different than the prince of Tyre. The prince of Tyre was the ruler of the actual city. The king of Tyre, I believe, was the one influencing or the one behind the 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 wickedness of the Prince of Tyre, which is none other than Satan himself. Do you know that's part of what the devil does? He is involved in the, the rising up of kings and empires. He can do that, and behind the scenes, there's a lot of satanic activity in that arena. We know that in Daniel. We, we saw that in Daniel, that that happens. So the devil himself was behind the wickedness of the prince of Tyre, and, but this is the origination of the devil, here referred to as the king of Tyrus. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Okay, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. The, the devil, yeah, in his original creation, God created the devil. We, we wouldn't call him the devil at that time. We would call him Lucifer. Now, Lucifer sounds like a scary name, but it was a name of God's highest created cherubim or angel. It, the devil was 
a created being of God, an angel, perfect in beauty, full of wisdom. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And then we have a list of these precious stones that are found on the breastplate of the, of the priest, the high priest of Israel. All of these things are beautiful. All of these things are wonderful. All of these things are, are gorgeous. And this was the way he was created. Look at the second part of 13. Prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. This was a beautiful being that God created. So that's how he originated and he actually can transform himself back into looking like that. He isn't like that. He isn't an angel of light. He's a fallen angel, the chief fallen angel, the devil himself. Thou hast... Thou art the anointed, verse 14, cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Remember, this is God and this is the devil. God created Lucifer. You say, why would God do that? Well, God knows the end from the beginning. It wasn't God rolling the dice and being surprised that Lucifer fell, but God has given the ability for at least the angels that we've read about here, the fallen angels or demons, Lucifer himself, to have the ability like we do, to choose. Now, they haven't been given the offer of salvation, which is interesting. We have. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee also. God set him. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Some of this we don't understand, but you can just imagine the imagery of heaven and and God created this, be, this beautiful being. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, here it is, the fall, till iniquity was found in thee. Where, where, when did that happen? We don't exactly know. Some people believe it was during, during creation. He was in the garden. We know for sure he was in the garden in the form of a serpent. We'll read about that in a second. But we know Satan fell. We don't know exactly when, but we know he fell. In Isaiah chapter 14, don't turn there, but make it, look it up later. Isaiah 14 speaks of Lucifer, the son of the morning. You have a series of statements. He says, I will, I will, I will. Whenever we start to say, I will, we're starting to show our pride, our desires, and we are putting that over the desires of our creator. And that's what Lucifer did, the son of the morning. He said, I will be like the most high. So this is the, the devil. This is the one that is, can transform himself into the angel of light. And his ministers can look good. They can look like they are of God, but they're not. Earlier in our text of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we already studied this, but in verse 3, the Corinthians are warned. He says, I'm fearful, but I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. So here in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, and in our text that we just read, we're finding that the serpent, and we find in Revelation, the serpent is the devil. We aren't told that explicitly in Genesis, but we know in Genesis 3, this serpent, it wasn't the serpent, the the creature that God created that was Satan, but it was Satan speaking through and influencing the serpent to beguile Eve. What is that word beguile? The serpent beguiled Eve. That means to seduce or to fool, trick. uh, Eve through his subtlety. You know, it wasn't like uh, there's the devil, and there's Eve, and he says, rah, you know? He didn't do that. Why'd you all jump? You didn't see that coming? Isn't that nice when you're the preacher? You see it coming, because I knew exactly what I was going to do. You okay? All right, good. The first row just became the second row. That wouldn't have worked, so he's subtle. He's he's talking, and by the way, wouldn't that have seemed weird? The, 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 The snake's talking, the serpent's talking. Now look at Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So what was that? We know part of the curse on the serpent was that it would slither on the ground and eat the dust, right? So people have postulated that the serpent must have had 
a different way of locomotion other than slithering. Maybe it had wings, maybe it had appendages, we don't know. But a lot of things changed, like roses got thorns, right? So there were physical changes at, at the fall, at, at, at the curse. So maybe uh, it had wings, or maybe it had legs. I don't know, but it wasn't unusual for that serpent to be eye to eye with Eve. And it wasn't a scary, slithery snake. Most of you would probably run away from a snake if I told you that I had let a, a copperhead loose in this auditorium before you came in today and I don't know where it is but I know it's in here somewhere most of you would be very worried about that now you're kind of worried about it and you're not certain you're, you know I'm capable of a lot of things and maybe I did we were swimming the other day on our, on our trip, on our vacation, and it was a lake in Missouri, and uh, we get there, and, and we have our granddaughter, and she's playing around in the water on the sandy beach, and we're having a nice time, and there's other families, there's other kids. The last thing we're thinking of is a snake until we hear behind us, yeah, there was a copperhead spotted here this morning, and they cleared the beach. I'm like, if it was here this morning, why isn't it here now? You know, so all of a sudden we came very alert because we're very alert to that type of thing. So something must have been a lot different back then. We don't know exactly what it was, but it wasn't an unusual thing for a serpent to be eye to eye with you. You weren't running away scared from it. And it, maybe the animals, or at least this one, had the ability to speak. Now you say, animals can't do that. Have you ever seen parrots? They're actually very good. That's not them speaking, but they can mimic. And there's dogs. We had a dog that knew some words. He knew um, what was on the outside of a tree. Bark. You know? He knew what was on top of your house. Roof. I mean, amazing. We had an amazing dog. So animals can kind of mimic a little bit, but can animals speak? Well, here we find that this was more subtle, more beautiful, more amazing than any beast of the field. And this is the, the creature that the devil spoke through. He said unto the woman, yea, hath God said. That is the first thing the devil's going to do to fool you. What is it? He's going to put doubt in your mind. Hath God said. Doubt. There's a little question mark there, isn't there? He didn't just come out and, bah, you know, God is wrong. You know, he just, it's subtle, little increments, just a little bit. It's just like that, the door cracking open. And there, that doubt. And that's what the devil is always going to do. He's going to put a little seed of doubt in your mind. Does God really love you? If God really loved you, would he have just allowed you to get a cancer diagnosis? Would God be, why, if God really loved you, would he make, be making you go through chemo and have to go through surgery and radiation and lose your hair? If God really loved you, would he do that to you? I know that's happened, and I know if you've had cancer, that you've, you've probably had that seed of doubt. And if you're wise... You're going to put that out and say, you know what? Answer it with the word of God. That's how Jesus answered the, the devil. He answer it with the truth of the word of God. So the first thing is doubt. And Eve opened the door right there. The next thing, uh, he said, you won't surely die. So the first thing was doubt. The second thing was deny. He denied God's word. God said, yes, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. But he first opened doubt. Did God really say that? You won't die. And the third is deify. Okay? Doubt, deny, deify. You will be like God. All right? So that is his trick. That's his trick in Genesis 3. That's his trick today. Don't be fooled. You've been all warned. Everyone in this room, everyone watching, you've been warned warned. If a bad angel can assume the appearance of a good angel, then why can't a bad man assume the appearance of a good man? That's what we're talking about today. Don't be fooled. Satan is crafty. He imitates. He says his offer is better. You've seen that, right? 
This, this place that we stayed was also a timeshare. We didn't, we don't, I don't do timeshares. Um, I've had enough people. If you see a commercial, how to get out of your timeshare, I pretty much know that's probably not for me. Uh, we once sat through that. If you go through this, you'll get this gift card, and you get this free, and you do all this. All we want is an hour. Okay, so we sat down, and we did it. We're like, we're not gonna buy it. We're not gonna buy it. We just wanna get this free stuff. So we sat there, and then the pressure Oh my goodness, have you ever been through one of those? Raise your hand. You've been through one of those. I mean, man, by the end we're like, where do we sign? <laughs> you only want 10,000? We wanna give you $15,000. You know, it's like, whew, I don't know what they did, but they did a good job, you know? But then we're, we were at this place the other day and um, they said, you know what? You can get this and this and this free if you just come to this for an hour. I'm like, no. The guy's like, no, seriously, I mean, this is an amazing, I'm like, no. He's like, why? I said, because I've been to one before. He's like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> and then while we're there, we see all these salespeople walking these people around. I would just wanted to shout, don't do it, don't do it. Anyways, if you, if you did it, it's cool. That's a good deal for you. <clears throat> a better offer. You, you really think Satan has a better offer? You think he does? Or maybe you can just take that same money and go anywhere you want to. I mean, that's a, that's, I don't know, what, whatever, whatever. Satan is crafty. Don't be fooled. Number two, being a Christian is not foolish. You say, wait a second, you said it's okay to be foolish. Well, let's get to this first. First of all, don't be fooled by the devil. Second of all, being a Christian isn't a stupid thing. It's actually a very smart thing. 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen. I say again, let no man ta- think me a fool. You say, wait a second, I thought he said earlier that it's okay if people think I'm a fool, but he's, he's here saying, don't think of me as a fool. If, if otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me, that I might boast myself a little. He says, okay, I'm not a fool, but if you think I am, I'm going to come in. It's okay, I'm okay with that, but I'm not a fool. Christians aren't fooled. Christianity is not foolish. Some may say you are. Some may call you a Bible thumper. Some may say you've, you've lost it, or you drank the Kool-Aid, or you're religious now. No, I just believe Jesus, the Son of God, died for me on a cross. I believe the Bible is true. I'm gonna live for him. It's not stupid, it's not foolish, it's the right thing. But people will obviously think of you as a fool. He said, okay, so I'm gonna have to, and we'll talk about that in the next point, I will have to do what I don't wanna do, do what the Lord wasn't gonna do, and that's give you a list of my accomplishments and a list of the things that I've gone through for the sake of the gospel. But Christianity is not foolish in and of itself. It's the right thing to do. Some people have looked at the English language and said, it's foolish. Some of our students that come from abroad, they come to study at Dayspring from all over the world and they get here and they know some English because we don't let them in unless they know some English. But you don't know English until you've been in an English speaking country and you're conversational. And we have so many weird words that we say that, that don't make any sense, right? And English is foolish, if you ever thought about it. How about the word eggplant? There's no egg in eggplant. I have never seen ham in hamburger. Have you ever seen ham in hamburger? How about pine or apple in pineapple? It, has, it doesn't have either one. What a crazy language. English muffins were not invented in England, nor French fries in France. What a weird language we have. You've heard of quicksand? That's the sand that takes you down slowly, slowly. Weird. Boxing rings are square. We need to to rethink some of this. If a teacher taught, why doesn't the preacher prod? Vegetarians eat vegetables. Why don't humanitarians eat humans? I don't know. All I know is people play at re, uh, people recite at plays, and they play at recitals. We know we park on driveways and we drive on parkways. English is just a foolish language. But Paul is saying here, look, even though Christianity is right and it's far from foolish, it's okay being called a fool if if more people can hear the gospel and be saved. Isn't that cool? Number three, it is foolish to have to list your accomplishments. This isn't something you should have to do. But you know what? Paul was finding himself having to do this. 
There were two guys that had a very short list of accomplishments in their life. They were given the job to go measure a telephone pole. You think that'd be a pretty easy job? Go measure the height of a telephone pole. So they went out there. One guy started climbing up, couldn't get up there, slid back down. The other guy tried to climb up with the tape measure, slid back down. They were having most, the most trouble with measuring the height of this telephone pole until this really big, strong, muscular man comes along. Yeah, what are you guys doing? We're trying to measure the height of the telephone pole. He goes, oh, here, let me help you. He goes around and grabs it and picks it up, pulls it out of the ground, lays it down, measures it. He said it's 30 feet, puts it back in the ground and walks away. The guys were like, that guy is so stupid. We didn't want the width. We wanted the height of the telephone pole. So what's the list of Paul's accomplishments? 2 Corinthians 11, 17. By the way, we're getting into that in the next message. We're not getting into the list right now. But that which I speak, I speak not after the Lord. In other words, we don't find the Lord talking the way I'm, a, I'm forced to talk or I'm about to have to talk, okay? But as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. He said, hey, you guys bought into this? You guys were, were believing these false apostles and believing what they're saying? Okay, I will do, I will do what they do in order to snap you back into it. In order for you to, you've gone so far down the path of foolishness, I'm going to have to be a fool and list my accomplishments to snap you out of that. For you suffer fools gladly. Do you feel that as a little sarcasm? You guys like fools. <laughs> Seeing ye yourselves are wise. It's interesting when you find a little sarcasm detected in scripture, isn't it? But this is not the way the Lord's gonna do it, but because of their foolishness, because they believe the lie, of the false apostles, Paul's going to have to list those things that he has gone through in order to bring them the gospel. And it's a pretty amazing list. When we get into that next time, you're, you're gonna be astounded. You say, how could one person go through all of that? But you know what that is? It's a pretty impressive resume of how much he loves giving the gospel. So it's foolish to have to do this, but he's going to do it for the sake of the gospel. And number four, you may still be labeled as a fool. After all of this, you still may be labeled as a fool. We talked about the label on the sweatshirt at the beginning, right? Uh, have you ever seen labels that don't make any sense? Labels. I saw this on a hairdryer. Do not use while sleeping. So, I mean, these are true on a bag of Fritos. You could be a winner, no purchase necessary, details inside. You've seen those? <laughs> Frozen Dinner says this, serving suggestion, defrost. This was a dessert, a tiramisu. It said, do not turn upside down. And that was printed on the bottom of the box. <laughs> there was uh, on, a, on a jar of peanuts, warning, contains nuts. And then on a chainsaw, do not attempt to stop chain with your hands. <laughs> Very dangerous. So you want to make sure you read those labels. But people might label you foolish, and if they do, you know what? That should be okay. Let's look at 2 Corinthians eleven twenty. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage. Uh, okay, th so th this is what can happen to a Christian, and this is what was happening to the Corinthians, and this is what could happen to you by these people that are transforming themselves into the ministers of the gospel, though they're really not. They're in it for themselves. They will bring you into bondage. If a man devour you, they'll try to devour you. If a man take of you, or take you, take you in, reel you in. If a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. These are things that we, we would say aren't becoming to people, right? We would not want those things to happen to us. But these are things that happen to Paul. These are things that happen. People try to do this all the time. I speak as concerning reproach. As though we had been weak, howbeit whereinsoever any is bold. I speak foolishly. I am bold also. The Corinthians thought that Paul's meekness was weakness. That's not what it was. We're not talking about weakness here. We're talking about meekness. And that was really his strength, and that's really our strength. But this list, this bondage, they, they taught the doctrine of legalism. You have to do these certain things for God to save you. You have to do these certain things 
It's legalism. It's bondage. They're trying to put you into bondage. They try to devour you. They're taking advantage of the financial support that, that he should have been receiving, they were receiving. They're, they're trying to devour you. They're taking of you, they're, or to fool you, take you in. The uh, imagery here in the original Greek was a snare for a bird or a hook for a fish. You ever gone fishing, you put a little, you put, you put a hook and you put a worm on the hook and you wanna make sure that none of the, the hook is exposed and you throw that out there and they bite the worm, but they're actually biting the hook and they reel you in. Going back to timeshares. Or clickbait, you ever heard of clickbait? My wife and I were sitting in the living room the other day and she goes, oh honey, look, there's a news story, Joel Olstein's quitting the ministry. I said, don't click it, don't click it. He'll never quit the ministry, it's too lucrative. Oh, sorry, did I say that out loud? <clears throat> You've seen those? By the way, if you're ever about to click on something, it's kind of a, wow, that, that's amazing. I don't think that would ever happen. Uh, read for the word sponsored somewhere around there. Okay? Sponsored stories aren't real news. Okay? It's clickbait. Don't do that. They exalt themselves. What is a minister of the gospel supposed to do? Exalt Christ. And if you have someone exalting themselves, they are not of God. And then smite you. These Judaizers never hesitated to verbally slap them in the face. And you know what? They did that to Christ in Luke twenty two sixty four. They blindfolded him, they struck him on the face, and they said, prophesy, who did it? And that's sad. But if that's gonna happen to Christ, these things can happen to us. The Corinthians were fooled. Paul was setting them straight. And he's gonna have to list his accomplishments, those things that he went through for the sake of the gospel. Back in 1 Corinthians, in chapter one, verse 21, we read this, for after... in for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Foolishness of preaching. It is said that D.L. Moody was once invited to preach at the sophisticated New York Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Moody was anything but sophisticated. People that knew Moody would never use the word sophisticated. And actually, some of the people were embarrassed that they even invited him to this Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church because these were intellectual parishioners, you know. They didn't want him, but some of them came anyways. He was going to preach on Daniel, but D.L. Moody wasn't able to pronounce Daniel. He would call it Daniel, okay? They said he had a high nasal twang. He would say the word ain't. And actually, sometimes he would say the word hate. He was heavy. They said his beard was just overflowing. It was actually coming up into his eyes. And they were sitting there just like, I can't believe he's preaching in our pulpit. And they're embarrassed. And some were snickering. But Moody kept preaching. About halfway through the sermon, people that were snickering began to stop snickering and began to sit on the edge of their pew. They were no longer hearing D.L. Moody. They were now listening to another voice, and that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. That is the foolishness of preaching. It is not about the preacher. It is about what the preacher is preaching about. It is about the Spirit of God preaching through the preacher and doing something to impact our lives because God wants to make you more like his son, Jesus I didn't list this verse, but a few verses before in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it talks about the foolishness of the gospel. The preaching of the cross is to them foolishness. To them that perish, foolishness. But to us, it is the greatest thing. The preaching of the cross is the power unto salvation, right? The cross is a symbol of execution. Think about this. What we're saying is Almighty God allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. The creator of the stars, the vastness of space, the massive size of the stars, the intricacy of all creation, he, this great, mighty, powerful God, allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. That's stupid. 
And how could that act of humility and submission and weakness possibly save me? It's foolish. But to them that perish, it's foolish. But to us, those that have believed, those that have received that gift of eternal life to say that death on the cross of the perfect son of God, his blood poured out a willing sacrifice for my sins, I believe in him. I trust in him. I put my full dependence in him and I'm saved for all eternity. I'm sealed by the spirit of God. To me, the cross is the most precious, wonderful thing in the world. But if people call me a fool, it's fine. It's fine. Because I found the truth. I found eternal life. I found hope beyond the grave. Because Jesus died and rose again, I put my faith in him. So shall I rise again. I will forever be in heaven with God. I've been reconciled back to God. What happened in the garden by our forefathers, Adam and Eve, is set right by Jesus the last Adam. And now we can be with God forever in heaven. There's a day when the Bible says the devil, that old serpent, will be thrown into the bottomless pit and locked up and the key thrown away. Until that day, let's be aware. Let's not be fooled. But let's realize that people might call us foolish and if it's for the sake of souls and for the sake of the gospel, that's okay. I'm fine with that because I know that my Redeemer lives. Do you know that your Redeemer lives? Have you ever put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? D.L. Moody would preach these verses. He believed strongly in salvation by grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Aren't those precious words? God loves us. He's loved all of us. He loved the world, the, the, the world that he created. He, he gave his only begotten son. That's an incredible act of, of generosity and grace and kindness. He sent his son that whoever believes in him should not perish, which is hell, but have everlasting life, which is heaven. So this verse and many others in scripture say, that I can be saved by faith, by believing. See, a lot of churches teach, and a lot of religious people teach, that you can be saved by Jesus plus your works, what you do. Here's another verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's the same word as believe. See that word over there, believe? In the Greek, one is pistis, one's pistuio. It's the same word. One's a noun, one is a verb. This is the noun, faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. How many gifts do you pay for? If you pay for a gift, you've negated the gift. It's no longer a gift. It is now something you paid for. Okay, it is a gift of God, not of works. How many gifts have you worked for? If you work for a gift, it's no longer a gift. You've negated the gift. So you say, I, I'm saved by Jesus plus my works. If you enter in yourself at all, what you're saying is that Jesus didn't do enough or Jesus didn't have to die. That's blasphemy. Jesus died because that was the only way and by faith in him, I can be saved. That's the only way of salvation. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. No one would say, I'm in heaven because I deserve to be here. Everyone in heaven will say, I don't deserve to be here, but I put my faith in the one who paid for my sin on a cross. That's the only reason we'll be standing in heaven because we put our trust in him. And then we have eternal life at the very moment. We're sealed into the day of redemption by the spirit of God. Let me show you this one last illustration. This is sin and all of us have it. Fallen short of the glory of God. God is perfect and holy. He doesn't have any sin. He can't sin. That sin that we have separates us from him. But his desire is to buy us back, but we can't do anything about it. So what are we gonna do? For all of sin and come short of the glory of God, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see what just happened? The Lord Jesus, who was perfect, paid for our sin on a cross. And all we have to do is by faith receive him, accept him, trust in him. One time, the Bible says, you've passed from death to life. You have eternal life. You are in Christ. You say, what if I let go? All right, what happens? He still has you. He still has you. There's gonna be times in your life and you're gonna have 
uh, your faith wane a little bit or you're gonna have doubts creep in, but you know what? If you put your faith in Christ, you have eternal life. You're born again. You cannot become unborn. That's the greatest truth I can share with you today. And it's not the truth that I'm giving you. It's the truth the Bible's giving you. And if you won't call me a fool because I said all that, I don't care. Because being foolish sometimes is a good thing. Would you please bow with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? I want to have a moment between you and God as we close today. This is just between you and God and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I, I, I know I can't do anything about that myself. I can't save myself, but right now, I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't look at the cross as foolishness anymore. I look at it as power unto salvation. And if you're doing that today, the Bible says you are saved. You are saved for all eternity. You've passed from death to life. You shall not perish, but have eternal life. Can I pray for you if you've made that decision today? Your prayer is not what saves you. Raising your hand is not what saves you. Saving you is your simple faith in Jesus. So can I pray for you today if you've done that? Would you raise your hand? I won't embarrass you, just hold it up for a second. I won't call you out, I just wanna pray. Praise God for you, and pray for you, who today has received that free gift of eternal life. Is there anyone today? I see you, any others today? Something you do one time in your life and you have eternal life, anyone else? You've walked in here not sure of your eternal life, but you just heard the message of the gospel. Foolishness to some, but today you've realized that it is powerful. It is literally taking you from hell to heaven. Anyone else today making that decision? Can I pray for you? Would you raise your hand? I see another. Are there any others today? Lord, bless all today that are here. Bless those that have indicated they're putting their faith in you. Bless those that have made that decision but didn't raise their hand because we know you know the heart. Father, you know the person that has received that gift by faith. We thank you for that wonderful message of salvation. We might be called a fool. We might be called eccentric. We might be called weirdos. But Lord, we are thankful to be on your side because we know you have the victory. We know the devil will be vanquished and his demons. Lord, help us to live in light of what you've done for us. Lord, help us to be foolish if, it, if that's what it takes for the sake of souls. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray these things. Amen.